So we have 14 talks for you. Hopefully you'll get through those pretty quickly. Up first we have Russell Stewart, who's going to be talking about LR parsing, uh, followed by Graham Cross. Uh, Russell, your time starts now. Hello everyone. <laughs> Mike's on. I'm going to talk about uh, a module I wrote called LR parsing, well that's what I've dubbed it. It's actually just another mouse trap. We have lots of these mouse traps. I'm going to try and convince you that this mouse trap is an improvement over the previous models. Uh, it is surprise, surprise, a parser. Um, for those of you who don't know what a parser does, a parser is something we use to recognise computer languages. So they take in a set of text. Uh, you might write it to use them to write your own domain specific language, or you might want to analyse existing code, that's in fact what I want to do. I wanted to tear apart some SQL statements. So just to reinforce what it does, this is extractively a, a string of text. Um, what we want to do is all of you being programmers have instantly parsed this text and it's obvious to you what it means, but it's not obvious to a computer. It's just a series of characters. The underlying bits are words. Obviously, that's the job of the tokenizer. Um, the parser then identifies bits of the word, so it'll say, well, where's a keyword, and selects a keyword, column is an identifier, greater than is an operator, and four is a number, and so on. And then it'll say, well, okay, this thing here on the end, that's another expression. So I can just call that an expression. And we continue down, on the other end we have select and from clauses. We reduce it to another expression, we reduce it and what you end up there with a, is a tree-like structure, which uh, is usually called the parse tree. Um, so what any parser does really is take in a sequence of characters and output a parse tree. Now, as I said, there's lots of these mouse traps. Um, there's lots of these mouse traps. A quick hit of uh, parsing on uh, PyPy will be about 821. Uh, the one that I later discovered, thanks to Nick, that everyone actually uses is uh, Ply, but Ply happened to be number 506. Now, I looked at a few of these, but I didn't look at all of them, and I didn't get to 506. So why use uh, LR parsing at all? If I had I found Ply, it wouldn't exist, but I didn't. So, <laughs> the first one is speed. I don't know whether you've used PY parsing, it looks easy to use. There's the SQL statement up there. PY parsing doesn't parse it. it um, at least the example grammar they have doesn't parse it, but others do. If you look at LR parsing, it's nearly twice as fast as its nearest competitor. Uh, the next one is documentation. I tried a few of these. Learning how to drive them is an exercise in frustration. So PY parsing gives you lots of sample code and urges you to buy their book. Uh, parsing, which is what I moved to next, a very capable parser written by an academic, has comments in the source code. Out of that lot, Ply definitely has the best part, uh, tu it's a tutorial. Um, LR parsing has Sphinx-like documentation, 10K words thereof. And it goes on and on and on, uh, including the tutorial. Uh, it also comes with a working SQLite 3 parser, which I um, tested on all the SQLite unit tests, so it's parsed 2,600-odd SQLite 3 statements. And finally, I wanted to convince myself it really could be a compiler, so I wrote a Lua to Python compiler, Lua being the simplest language there is, and Python being a machine I know more about. Uh, in terms of simplicity, uh, I just use PI metrics to compute the size of source code of each, and I think the size of source code is a real reasonable indication of how hard the thing is to understand. Uh, in terms of parsing power, um, there are non-deterministic parsers out there. Um, of the non-non-deterministic ones, LR parsing is one of the best. In terms of expressing the grammar, the top one is LR parsing, the bottom one is ply. This is actually unfair to LR parsing because you see it specifies the tokenizers in its three lines. 
there is literally an order of magnitude difference in the amount of stuff you have to enter to get the same recognition. 10 seconds. Uh, LR parsing is actually a compiler. It compiles your statements to LR, LL1 Five, productions, four, and thus it gives you three, other useful things. Two, one. Error Thank message you very is good. much, Russell. And uh, I, I think it speaks volumes of this community that we got a round of applause when you mentioned documentation. <laughs> um, so, um, up next on this podium will be Russell Keith McGee. Um, Graham Cross is up next, who will be presenting Graham Cross Citizen Engineer. Your time starts now. Can you hear me? Um, in the keynote yesterday, Alex oh, touched geez. on a topic that's dear to my heart, and a few other people did in the keynote, I mean the lightning talks. Engineering. It's the intersection of science, technology, and society. I'm a scientist. Uh, I pretend to be an engineer. I work in biomedical technology. The thing that fascinates me, though, is society. And in particular, how can we help society? If you look at how um, society has changed across human lifespan, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, Industrial Revolution, Information Revolution, all driven by technology. So how can we as technologists shape the future? We're uniquely placed because we're smart, we've got skills, and I think that means we have a responsibility. This book, if you're not familiar with it, is probably the book that helps shape the thinking about social responsibility and engineering. If you've not seen it, Hunt it up, have a read, it's a fantastic book. So this is 72 slides, which may be the record for a lightning talk on how can we do this. We engage, we communicate, we lead as engineers. So I'm gonna talk about a few different areas in which I think we can make a difference. Small differences as individuals, collectively large, 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 large differences. I do not pretend to have all the answers, but I do have suggestions, so hold on to your seat and let's go for a ride. Children are our future. We're part of a community, this is a community. We're all parts of virtual communities. We live in urban communities, suburban communities, rural communities. It is a massive part of how society thrives and changes. Our rights. Edward Snowden has showed that our rights are constantly under threat and there is a real chance of erosion and that the future generations live in a society that George Orwell would have absolutely shuddered about. Computing. We've talked a lot about computing for some reason this weekend. We're all part of the world. And I'm serious about that. We may think that things like curing cancer is outside of our domain, but from everything you've seen this weekend, Pandas, IPython notebooks, things like that are written by people like us and used every day by scientists around the world to help make the world a better place. If you don't know how, there's things like random hacks of kindness, which is where people come together and hack to work on things like disaster management, community um, websites and things like that. I hope you don't feel like I've preached to you, but I do hope that this challenges you, inspires you, and that when you wake up in the morning, you actually feel like you have a purpose and that you can make the world a better place. Call me optimistic and naive,
Okay, uh, so on this side of the room, uh, we have Russell Keith McGee, and uh, up next on this side is Frank. Um, so, Russell is going to be presenting on Django user groups, and his time starts. We ready to go, Mark? Now. All right, so thank you very much. Um, this actually talks, uh, uh, dovetails nicely into the previous talk, or at least one, one set of slides from that previous talk. We're talking about, about Django users groups around Australia and around the world. Okay, who here is from Perth? Show of hands if you are from Perth. All right, how many of you did not know that there is a Perth Django users group? Uh, okay, so there is a Perth Django users group. We meet on the third Thursday of every month at Space Cubed in the city. Uh, there is a meetup page you can go to, sign up, and, and, and you're more than welcome to, welcome to come along. Who here is from Melbourne? All right. Who are the most people from Melbourne did not know that there was a Melbourne user, a Django users group? All right, there is a Melbourne Django users group. Uh, they are also on Meetup. They meet, uh, they're hosted by Common Code. You're more than welcome to turn up. Who we hear is from Sydney. Okay, how many people, oh sorry, not Thursday, third Thursday of the month, who, uh, um, but uh, who didn't know that there was a side Django, a, a Sydney Django users group? Okay, there is a Sydney Django users group. Uh, it's, sorry, ignore the slide, not the third Thursday of the month. I the pattern. Yes, exactly. Um, who here is from Brisbane? Okay, who here, we don't unfortunately have a Django users group in Brisbane, but we do have a, uh, a Python users group in Brisbane. Uh, who here didn't know about that? No, they all know about it. Excellent. All right, they're also on Meetup, so you can go along. Who here is from Adelaide? All right, get to know each other, because apparently you haven't got a users group. <laughs> who here is from Hobart? Right, you all need to get to know each other, because there isn't one there either. Okay, they're the users groups for all the capital cities. Obviously, anyone who's from a regional centre. Cam oh, sorry, Canberra. Damn. State capitals? <laughs> Oops. All right, who here is from Canberra? Okay. Is there a Canberra users group for Django? Yes, right, okay. So who organises it? Person. Put your, put your hand up. No, all right. Are you on Meetup? Are you on Meetup? I, no, okay, right. Well, apparently there is one. Find someone from Canberra and find out. Uh, Google it. There we go. All right. Upcoming events, for those who don't know, DjangoCon US is being held in Chicago this year. The Call for Papers has closed, conference tickets are available. It's a fantastic opportunity to meet the US Django community, which is quite large. Uh, and Chicago, as I'm told, haven't been there myself, is apparently an awesome city, so uh, a re really great chance to get out there and meet some, meet some Django Nauts. Uh, coming up next year, April 2014, PyCon US is in Montreal. Um, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. What is this geography? Um, uh, the call for papers for that is open, website is up, I don't, ticket sales won't be for a little while, but that is also a fantastic opportunity to meet North American uh, and worldwide Django users. Uh, next year, May, uh, probably May 2014, date to be announced, we're not quite sure yet, DjangoCon Europe will be on again. Uh, it is going to be hosted on the French Riviera. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, DjangoCon Europe this year is in Warsaw and it was one of probably the best conferences I've ever been to. It was awesome and um, uh, the, the French team is, is claiming that they're going to be able to, they're, they're going to take it even further. So if you can get to the French Riviera next year, I highly recommend it, if only because it's the French Riviera. And uh, lastly, DjangoCon Australia 2014. It is going to happen. Dates and locations to be announced. I'm led to believe possibly to be announced in about 30 minutes, um, because it is also going to be a mini conf, the same as it was this year, as, an, as stuck to the front of uh, PyCon Australia. So wherever PyCon Australia is, DjangoCon will be there too. Um, we need people to help, okay? If you are interested in helping to volunteer PyCon, uh, sorry, DjangoCon Australia next year, or for that matter, PyCon Australia next year, uh, please get in contact with me or with Chris Nogaba and um, we'll get a team together and make next year's DjangoCon even better than it was this year. Speaking of DjangoCon Australia 2013, those of you who weren't there, we didn't have a conference shirt because, uh, because it's a mini-conf, we didn't have the budget, but we do have a shirt which you can buy. US $15 a shirt, $10 postage and handling, $1 for each extra. T-string campaign, DCAU 2013 for a men's shirt. There's also a women's shirt. We need to sell 50 in order to actually go, do it printed. It's like a Kickstarter style thing. So uh, big thanks to Sajith Jawira for the design. Um, Please, go and buy a shirt. Uh, they're very pretty and it's a great place to have your little piece of um, uh, DjangoCon memorabilia. Uh, and it's also a fundraising activity. $7 from every one of the men's shirts, $5 from every the women's shirt is going to go directly to the Django Software Foundation. Uh, if you don't see those links, you can jump onto um, 
uh, jump onto the DjangoCon AU Twitter stream and the links have been posted there regularly over the last couple of days. You have to get your orders in by Wednesday next week, so just after the sprints the orders will close and about three weeks later they'll turn up on your doorstep. And that is me. There are, of course, Python users groups in Sydney and Melbourne, as well as the Django users groups. And I did suggest that perhaps uh, there could be a PyCon Canada run in the US next year. I got laughed at. Um, so, um, Reese Elsmore, can you set up on this one over here? On this side, we have Frank, who, please mind the microphone volume levels, Frank, who's going to be talking about what's in a name. Anyone who wants to come and work out how to build one of these, you'll need one. And if you build one, you'll also need to get to a shop and buy a pair of these. They certainly made yesterday very comfortable. Thank you very much. I was born south of the Maison Dixie line, so any American here who wants this can come and grab it from me. It found it in an op shop, use it wear it a lot, causes a great deal of mirth. Raw. I'm just a good guy with a, a, an assistant. We're not doing the playing today, for those who saw it yesterday. We were in version three of the talk. In version three, we're talking about global warming. Next slide. No, we're not. We're talking about global climate change. Next slide. <laughs> Interesting slide. Next slide. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Queensland, lovely spot, sunny, shine, sun shines all the time, and occasionally you get rain. Lately we've been getting a lot more of it up there. They're not enjoying it. My son's enjoying the keynote changing things. Wonderful. That's a mudslide. Took away a lot of the village. Go. That's the fear in a person's eye when they're facing something really nasty. We are facing something seriously nasty. Next. I don't know how that got there. This is what we're planning to try and build, uh, a system so that we can crowdsource information about where people's infrastructure is, so that we can help them build policy about where they're going to build that stuff, what they've got, and all the rest of it. Next slide. We don't have these guys. I don't know why not. I haven't worked out why not. We had them when I was... Aren't they puppets? Six or seven. <laughs> yeah, but they were really good puppets. They made a difference. They won. Every time they went to save you, your butt was saved. And, uh, it, and ours isn't at the moment. Next. Right, so that's what the project's called. It's lots and lots of different Python... Uh, lots of Java, lots of PHP. I'd like it all to be a lot more Python. The Python I've done has been very, very educational. I first ran into Python when I discovered that it was white space sensitive in about 1992, I think. Anyway, I put a white space in there and it died. <laughs> very alarming on the live website. Next. Same slide, keep going. What have you done to me? Okay, this thing, this thing was supposed to work, but it doesn't. We'd have to flip over to Safari, we'd have to wait for it to load, and it would take the whole five minutes. Essentially what it does is it gets the NetCDA file from the, next slide, ski from uh, this Tega server thing, it gets a NetCDA file from that, parses it, takes up an HTML5 um, uh, chart, puts the paths into the uh, Hansen table on the back of it and then plots it up in 2D. You can see for Tasmanian temperature data, you see that lovely picture of Tasmania, which I should have put in this slide, but I didn't. Keep going. If you're interested, you should go on this safari.org slash tiger. So it's a very interesting Python project run by NASA. They are obviously under source. They, half their site doesn't work because the NASA wouldn't allow it through the firewall. Anyway, next. <laughs> I'm in over my head. I think that's probably pretty obvious. We are running, we are running Tomcat, we are running uh, Apache, we are running Apache with a mod whizzy thing. Um, not very well at the moment. Uh, I, my, my think is that we should get together as some people should come and help me tomorrow. I'm 
here tomorrow for that sprinting thing. I'm hoping somebody will come and tap me on the head and beat me senseless and actually make a few of these things work for me. I mean, the ideas are good. The ideas are good, but the execution is shocking. I got trained as a, a sysadmin, and I really, I'm really good at sysadmin mostly. I can get that MySQL working. I'm having a bit more trouble with that, with that Tomcat thing. <laughs> and when people say, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's very straightforward, it just works, I don't believe them anymore. And, and it's, it's, yeah, you've got to be a specialist to get some of this stuff to go. Um, so if there are some specialists out there that can help me, I'd really love, particularly, I don't care where you are. In fact, if you're a foreign language speaker, that's even better. Because these people who I'm working with have got this, they've been talking to people in sub-Saharan Africa, right? And they all and want help! Up, thank you, I Frank. need help! <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Okay, uh, so on the lectern on this side, up next will be uh, David Beatty. Uh, and on this side, up next, we have Rhys Elsmore, who is going to be talking about Flask Analytics. Uh, your time starts now. Woo! Awesome. Okay, so Flask Analytics and a few other things that have been on my mind. Anyway, I'm Rhys Elsmore. I work for Heroku. Uh, quick show of hands, who's deployed Flask? Awesome. Django? Cool. And Rails? Come on, show of hands. Okay, it's good. Kenneth's got his hand up. <laughs> anyway, variety is important, especially for Kenneth. Mm. So, quick note, last night I came to the conclusion that a buffet is a lot like a worker queue. Uh, like this. Well, yeah, except there was uh, one problem. Not one of my salary workers has ever run out of chocolate cake. <laughs> Nothing. It's seriously <laughs> disappointing. So, we're thinkers, we're innovators, we are changing the world, and we have ideas. I thought this was genius. <laughs> anyway, it's hard to keep up with the changing methods of writing code as well. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Guess what? It actually works. <laughs> anyway, Flask Analytics. Flask is awesome, extensible, and it's easy. This is Flask Analytics, written about a month ago. Uh, it's very easy to install. This is the code to get it up and running. Uh, as you can see, a few lines. So this collects a lot of data. Uh, we've got the URL, the session, date, time. You know, some people might think it's over the top, but it captures every request. There's no JavaScript on the front end, no Google Analytics, nothing like that. And it sends this data to, to a remote controller for viewing. It's all wrapped up in a nice before request hook, and it's documented exactly what it does. <laughs> it uses existing Python packages, so fairly low dependencies. And this package is young. It, you know, the community is listening, they're getting involved with it. Actually, the community is talking at the moment. What? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> This was the first issue that popped up. You know, there's genuine concerns about this. Uh, you know, when, when we're not sending data to Prism, there's uh, synchronous I.O. issues. So there was a recommendation made to fix that up, but, you know, it's hard being a BFDL. You know, you've got to include these changes. You've got to take these concerns on board, and really, there were costs to this. Anyway. The community provides great suggestions. <laughs> then there was this. So it was decided that synchronous I.O. was the way to go. Regardless, open source equals freedom. Giggle. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. We will make sure that we do not send your lightning talk to the NSA. Thank you. Uh, can't speak for the DSD, though. <laughs> we know you're here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, on this lectern over here, uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss, please. And on my right hand side, we have David Beatty, who's going to be talking about a Python grab bag opinions for the unopinionated. Your time starts now. 
Hi, my name is David Beatty. Um, this is a grab bag of Python tools that uh, I find useful uh, that I work with. And here's some information about myself, very Pythonic. Uh, I'm from Townsville, North Queensland. Uh, I am very, very, very cold right now. Um, I work in uh, with uh, web integration and development, um, various different technologies and lots of different open source. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter. And the shameless plug is I'm setting up, uh, it's been a year now, but it's getting there, a Python uh, North Queensland users group. So is anyone from North Queensland? Ready? Don't, don't all sing out at once. <laughs> fantastic. Well, anyway. Brilliant, yeah, fantastic. But anyway, if you know someone in, uh, in North Queensland, Cairns, Townsville region, who works with Python or is interested, um, give them my details. Right, okay, so, help. I need to do something in Python. Good news, there's tons of Python packages on the package index. Bad news, there's tons of packages on the Python package index. There, and as, as of yesterday, there's almost 32,500 packages. So what do we do? What do we do with that? We need to look through this and find and learn good tools. Unfortunately, I'm not going to sit there and um, go through all of the package index because that's going to take forever. Hmm. And so effectively, the best way that i found is I come to talk like this and I listen to what you guys have to say. So thank you for that. And here are a couple of things that I've used. One of which is this meme generator, is the meme package, and that's it. Ta-da! <laughs> For those of you who want uh, you know, just to do it, that's it. You can go ahead and there. And um, I think uh, Fanstatic Natural Dogpile Cache is a fantastic band name. So these are the packages that we're gonna, gonna step through right now. Hmm. So to start with, um, a library called Natural. It's, uh, I, I'm, disclaimer, I haven't written any of these things, but I have contributed to them um, and fixed a number of different bugs and so forth, but yeah. So anyway, Natural is a library for converting uh, raw values into human format. Um, so for instance, you might take in, uh, it can deal with dates, delta, time deltas, um, durations, file times, sizes, throughputs, numbers, all sorts, and it can even turn um, turn words into Morse code, for instance. And so you can see here, uh, you can take huge numbers, uh, number.word in this library, for instance, massive long number, and it produces some output that I've never even heard of. Who's heard of that, uh, that suffix there? No idea. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so effectively, there's all these helpers, helper methods that can take your raw data and display it in something that's helpful for, um, for your users to read. And um, it's perfect for lolcats that speak, um, speak Morse code. Hmm. So yeah, so check out, uh, check out Natural. It's easy to install and no dependencies on that one. Um, for caching, uh, for a second one, so we'll step through these pretty quickly, um, but yeah, there'll be links on the end of the slides. For caching, for instance, um, dogpile.cache is one that I've used. It's a successor to the caching part of Beaker. Um, it, uh, it's able to use decorators, um, cache regions, um, have customizable expiration times per different functions and so forth, and uses a get and create pattern. So you might have similar things in other frameworks and so forth. This is just one thing that I've used. I use it with Pyramid, um, but it can work with whatever. Um, uh, in terms of caching backends, you can use Bemcache, Redis, any DM, RAM. So more or less, here you go. You take some input, um, it's very nasty there, confusing, and returns the ultimate uh, answer, which is clearly six by nine. In terms of, um, so web resources, uh, Fanstatic is a fun library to, uh, to work with. So effectively it builds on um, packaged JavaScript and CSS resources. Um, somebody packages these up and you can just include them like a normal dependency in your setup.py file. Gives you sane versioning, gives you URL generation, bundling, minification, and everything like that. And there's about 100 or so packages uh, in the JS namespace so far. Um, in terms of integration, it integrates with any WSGI application, Python frameworks, all that sort of thing there. And there you go. So the knights who say, eki, 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 and I'll leave the rest. Hmm. Nee. No, not knee. <laughs> not anymore. So yes, so the idea is learn everything effectively. But more or less, oh, still more time? Great, fantastic. More time. So anyway, so some more tools that I've worked with, um, talking to some people about. Tile Stash runs in Python, serves maps out. Combine it with a, a very fantastic tool called Tile Mill, and you can theme maps up using CSS and become your own Google Maps competitor. Um, UWSGI is an application container, serves everything from Python, Java, Ruby, Perl, Erlang, and more that I don't even know about. And in my experience, it's about 25% uh, you know, faster protocol than HTTP. And um, some more there too. So yeah, check out. 
And that's, that's your awesome. time. Okay, so next up on my right will be Matt Oakes. So if you can come and set up. And on my left, we have Jacob Kaplan Moss, who's going to be talking about pip install Python Nation. Your time starts now. So I wonder if uh, anyone's running this right now to install Python Nation. Um, a lot of times when you discover a new, a new Python package, it's, it's like this. Someone influential like Alex Gaynor tweets out that there's a cool thing you should check out, Python Nation. And so you, so you try it. You type pip install Python Nation. I think I hear people typing right now. Um, so let's talk about what happens when yeah. you type pip install Python Nation. Well, so pip uses the Python package index, so it's going to go to a um, particular URL, pypy.python.org, slash pypy, slash Python Nation. That's the package. And it's going to discover there um, a link to a, a file, to a, a, a .tar.gz file. Um, you can see uh, author is me. I, I uh, put it up there. As of this afternoon, about 100 people have downloaded this. Kind of interesting. Um, and so the next step that uh, Pip is going to do is if effectively what I've put up here. I've simplified to some extent, but Pip is going to download this this file, which is just a normal tarball, gzip tarball of of of, uh, of stuff. It's going to unpack that file, go into the directory that it unpacks, and run Python setup.py install, and that's going to spit out a bunch of stuff. And at some point. Um, Let's see, we make an egg, we add Python Nation to the easy install path file. Why do we still call it this? Um, we, we, this is going to be funny. We're going to be years from now. No one's going to know what easy install is, and it's still going to be there. Um, well, there's an interesting thing here. Um, Python setup.py install. Well, I mean, think about this. What, what we just did is we, we, we wrote, typed a command, it downloaded some code from the internet, and ran it. Does this make anyone a little bit uncomfortable? Well, you shouldn't be uncomfortable. It's just a simple setup script. If this is, I popped open setup.py in my, in my, in my uh, text editor, and it's, it's just a little, tiny little setup script. Um, look at that scroll bar. There's kind of something interesting here. Let's turn, um, let's turn a, a soft wrap on so we can see what's going on. Ooh. Uh, this is getting a little uncomfortable. Um, Exec, and why? You know, if it's running code, why would I possibly have wanted to gzip and compress it and base64 encode it so that you couldn't tell what's going on? Well, before I reveal the trick, um, let me tell tell you what I didn't do when you ran pip and saw Python Nation. <clears throat> uh, I did not send out Facebook updates on your behalf. I did not look for incriminating photos and post them online. Uh, you know, there's actually a nakedness detection algorithm. Um, it's, there's been a number of papers on this, so this is not as, uh, as difficult as you might think. Um, I didn't steal your private keys. I didn't remove your hard drive. And I considered, but ultimately decided not to take a picture of you. <laughs> I really thought about that. I was really tempted. There's a way on OS X to take a picture without turning the little green light on. So here's what this script actually does if you decompress it. Um, I get your login name. I get your host. I take a hash of Etsy password. I chose that file carefully because it's probably on all of your computers, but it's not actually that dangerous. It's not actually that big a deal. And I sent it to a little, uh, little app that I wrote. Let's t take a look here real quick and uh, see how many people <laughs> have joined the Python Nation. <laughs> So Ru Russ's computer is the hammer. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, hello. <clears throat> OK, so how scared are we? Is the sky falling? Is this a big deal? Well, it's not that big a deal to some extent. You're always running someone else's code when you download code. This isn't Pip's fault. This isn't PyPy's fault. Wheels will help this a little bit, but you're still running someone else's code. You just ran code because Alex told you to, because I told you to on a slide. This will never actually be fixed, right? We're never going to change this. When you pip install Django, you're trusting that Django is what it claims to be. So if this scares you, 
and for some values of you, I think it will, then you need to host your own packages. You need to download them locally, audit them by eye, check that they're not sending things to, certainly not sending things to uh, Prism, and then save, ca save and cache them locally. Here are two very good local package servers that you can and use for this, and I up. hope you Thank will. You Thank you. Much. Okay, so next up on my left will be Dylan Lacey. Um, and to present on my right, Grok Art, please welcome Matt Oakes. Your yeah, time hi. starts now. Hi. Um, I'm also responding to um, Alex's keynote yesterday morning uh, where he invoked art as one of the potential uh, pillars of the uh, software development profession. But I thought um, he dealt with it quite, uh, on quite a scant level. Um, now, I've done a bit of university study in art. Um, I've been a designer and I'm now a developer, so I thought perhaps I'm in a position to kind of unpack some of the more relevant ideas for all of you, and it, perhaps it'll um, give you some of the tools to help you understand what parts of what you do cross over into the realm of art. Uh, so what goes on in an artist's mind? How do we know if um, something we do is art? How do you do it? Who knows? Um, but quite likely, you're not actually doing art, per se. Um, you're doing something like art. Um, so art is an artist-driven, completely freeform thing. Uh, I've certainly got some projects I do in my spare time, uh, which fall into that category. Design is more that same kind of problem solving at work when there's a definite problem to address. Um, but underneath it all, on an everyday basis, no matter what problem you're solving, is uh, creativity. Um, and that is what makes us different from the computers. We could otherwise program ourselves away. Um, does everyone know what that is? <laughs> um, he might have been taking the piss, but it made a very big uh, splash in the 1917 um, Paris exhibition of high art uh, and it proved that art is more than just aesthetics, it really works in the realm of ideas. Um, and the other major advance in art of course, which I don't have time to cover really, is it moved beyond the object about uh, 50 years later. The object became um, unnecessary. So the the best theoreticians were grappling with this for a long time. That's uh, almost 50 years after uh, the fountain. Uh, and uh, Ad Reinhardt, the best he had to say was, art is not what art is. Oh, I can't even say it. Exactly. Exactly. Try programming that. Um, so you get into more into what is art. The models have improved over time. Uh, Donald Brook is an Australian guy who's written some very influential books. Um, and uh, these are some of his ideas taken from that book. Um, a very interesting one to me that art is the root of language. Like before there were words and anything written down, there were paintings and images and sounds and music uh, and mysticism. Uh, so that's an interesting underpinning. Uh, and then some basic rules for what constitutes art. Uh, sorry about my uh, markdown not... Uh, not rendering properly there. And so, to make it, bring it back to what's relevant to you people, I don't want to give you an art lecture. Um, you know, is any art actually like software? Um, and a lot is. Uh, conceptual art was very big in the late 60s. Um, people were paying big money for these crazy ideas. And essentially, they were just programs just a, uh, like an idea that you'd run in your head and go, wow. Uh, one of my favourite ones, the artist invoked a cubic mile of air above your head. Uh, but then that was at the moment where he instantiated it. And then after that, it's those particular molecules as they disperse. It was beautiful. Um, so just to convey an idea or a concept to the perceiver. Um, but essentially it's a program and that's led on to generative art. Uh, there's a very nice website there with some great links to, or 
all kinds of stuff, but essentially there the artist puts in train a process and the output of the process is recognised as art, hopefully. Um, there's a lot of research to, go, to do in there. Um, the most popular thing is uh, processing, which is based on Java. Um, but there's plenty of Python going on as well. It's very good for artists. And so this is what underpins the, um, underpins the body of knowledge, really, on conceptual... Oh, is that my time? Oh, You've got to read that. Uh, yep, yeah, that's time. Thank you. you read that. We uh, seem to have a, a slight, uh, slight timing failure here. So, uh, ooh, ooh. So I am going to get my stopwatch back up and running. Yeah, thank you so much. While we work on getting the holiday back. Uh, so on my right up next is going to be Ducky. Uh, and on my left to tell us about testing iOS apps with Appium, uh, Dylan Lacey, your time starts now. Hi, Con PyCon. So, who wants to be cool? We're not cool. We do Python, we do Ruby, that's not cool. iOS is cool. We want to do iOS, there's a problem. So, there's a tool called Appium. Appium is what happens when you combine Selenium, the browser automation tool, with iOS. Uh, Selenium is a framework for automating browsers. You can use real browsers like a real user, so it functions like a real user, and it can run locally or remotely. There's a problem, is that iOS isn't a browser. How is this going to work? So native app controls are kind of like web controls. You have fields, you have buttons, you scroll, you click, you slide, uh, you assert on tests, you assert on content, and you probably want to automate your tests because doing it manually makes you want to cry. So web testing is like this. Rubyists, Rubyists love testing. Pythonists love testing. iOS people do this. <laughs> what testing tools? Exactly. So how does this work? How can you test on iOS? Well, Appium is a framework for Selenium. Your test is in that diamond. All our tests look like diamonds. Uh, then Selenium talks the remote protocol to Appium, which functions as a server, which uses instruments.js, which is a node protocol. See, we're getting cooler by the second. Um, <laughs> which talks to the Apple iOS emulator. So you probably think I'm lying. This is what it looks like to set a session up, mostly. You tell it what your web driver is, the Selenium web driver remote. You tell it where your server lives, uh, and then you give it a set of desired capabilities, which say, give me a remote server that functions much like this. Uh, so for instance, you can find values by calling the, the Selenium methods. Find me a tag that's called table cell. Make sure that its uh, name is equal to buttons, various usions of UI button. Uh, you can interact with them by flipping switches on and off. You can see their value changes. You can get values by tag. You can send keys to things. You can scroll up and down. It's very exciting. So a demo now. Appium is an open source product. You download it. Then you don't find it when you're trying to give a talk. Uh, oh. Na, 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 na. There we go. That's what Appium looks like. Now Appium is running. Everybody wins. This is what our test looks like. It's a standard pi unit test. I'm not going to go through it because I don't have enough time. Uh, Python, no. Python UI catalog. UI catalog is a uh, app that simply shows you what you can do with the Apple UI, and it's running in the background because that's the best thing it could be doing. There we go. So our test is now operating this app, and like a good test, it's stopping and going back to the start over and over again, which may not be that visually interesting, I apologize. The Ruby version is not a good test, but it looks better, but I thought I would show you in the, the Python version. Um, so it's, it's running through things as a user would. It's typing in the, the Apple emulator, it's running assertions. You can see in the background there the, uh, the server itself is running. And at the end of it, our console output will tell us whether the test succeeded or not. Appium also works for Android. It works on real devices. Uh, it works remotely or locally. If you want to use iOS, there are two options. The first one is you have one of these. And the second option is you use one of these. Um, we have a Mac cloud that allows you to do iOS testy stuff. If you're an open source project, you get free access to our, our stuff forever. Um, and I have some free minutes to give away to all of you at the end of my presentation as well, unless I run out of time, in which case you don't get free stuff. Um, Five sec, no. All right. 
You can host remotely, you can connect them to a grid, you can run in parallel. That's really f***ing cool. Uh, and you can pay someone else to bother. Um, 60 okay. seconds. I, I added a GIF because the last time I gave this talk, everybody else had animated GIFs and I felt very alone. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. The Appium site is appium.io. If you use the keyword fjords when signing up for Source Labs, you'll get 1,750 minutes. So if you don't have a Mac, you can derp around with um, uh, iOS, uh, Android automation, and Appium kind of stuff. Hit me up on Twitter if you have questions, or dylan at sourcelabs.com. Thank you. Gosh. Ruby people getting up on stage and telling us we're not cool. Ugh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but you know, at least you can speak half the truth. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so on my left will be uh, Mark Pesci and the rest of the Moore's Cloud type people. Uh, on my right is uh, Ducky, who is going to be telling us all about CompCon. Uh, your yes. time starts now. Uh, hi, I'm Ducky. Um, CompCon, basically. Uh, Computing students, you may have been computing students, you may be computing students, you may have never been a computing student in your life, but hey, computing students could be the future of uh, computing. We kind of hope a bit. Um, so we've decided that they might need a national conference for computing students. Uh, law students have them, lots of other faculties have them, so we decided we might run our own. Um, I'm Ducky, I'm a UTAS student here. I study computing and science, double degree, yay. Um, I'm also the president of Tux, which is the computing society here, and I was contacted by some lovely people uh, of the ANU Computer Science Students Association um, last year at 3 a.m. when I was studying for exams, and they decided, and well, we talked for a while, and we were like, hey, it would be awesome if we could get all the computing students from all the different universities to come and not exactly have a party, but maybe a few parties, and like a conference like this one, and talk about things that we're learning about um, and what we should be learning about because a lot of people think that computing isn't taught as well as it should be and there are a lot of different ways to teach it and we thought we should have a conference to discuss ways that we the students might like to be taught, like things we want to learn that aren't currently being taught. Um, so that's what ComCon is for. But we are currently looking for speakers, and I know for a fact there are some fantastic speakers out there. Uh, I've heard lots of you talk, so I'm kind of hoping that telling you guys about this might make you interested in coming and speaking um, at ComCon. Um, we're also looking for papers. We also have a careers fair, so we're looking for any people who want to set up a stall and kind of in dark new students to come and work for them because there are some really talented ones out there. Sponsors are nice too. We have a few sponsors at the moment and we're actually fine as it is for money, but you know, more is always good. And <laughs> um, of course, like the most important thing we need is students and that's because it's a conference for students. Yo, Ducky, um, <laughs> I'm happy for you. I'm going to let you finish, but I got a few tips. It's going to be the best lightning talk of all time. Whoa. Okay, so this is how to write overview slides for fun and profit. Okay, so what you know what you need, and what I'm going to be talking about today is why you need them, why they're useful, how to make them, and how to make them entertaining. Then how to make them fun, and then how to make them those things and worthwhile. And then what we're going to talk about is how it's what's appropriate to put in there and what's not appropriate to put in there. And then I'll go through a summary with you. So the first section: Why do you need overview slides? It's so that people know how long they will be bored for. So people have. It's also so people have time to finish tweeting before your presentation starts. It's very important. And it gives a reason to skip, for you to skim through the bulk of your presentation. Um, so, overview slides are very useful at annoying people. Um, and for repeating things that you've already said. And for repeating things you've already said, but as well as repeating things you're about to say or you've already said. So, I'll talk about a little bit now on how to make them, because that's important as well. So, you start with a list of things you'll cover in your talk. So it's a list. And then what you do is you load it into a blender. And you don't put the lid on, because that's stupid. You wait for the topics just to fly out, but then you realize that was a stupid idea, because now you need to make another list of the original content. So things that are appropriate to put in overview slides, um, section headers and uh, detailed section headers. Um, things that you will definitely say again, because studies have shown that humans learn better if you repeat everything twice in a row without pausing. Studies have shown that humans learn better. So, things that aren't appropriate to put in overview slides 
are pictures, unless your talk is only pictures in which you have an overview of in pictures. So, but anything that isn't words, don't. Wait, wait, okay, so I'll, I'm going to go through a summary with you. So what I've been through so far is why, why you needed overview slides, why, why they were useful to you, how you would go about making them, what's appropriate to put in there, and then, and then a bit of a summary at, at the end. Um, so I have a list of references, and if you would actually like to go to that website, you'll find a lot about, about my, my talk. Um, so, so next time, you, uh, I'll, I'll probably give something like this. Um, that is also a very important topic. Um, and how to read your slides with a back to the audience, and it's so people can't hear you. Okay, so that that's also a very important thing. You should probably talk to Ducky a little bit more about that. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go home. See ya. So that's uh, the email address. Talk to us about uh, ComCon. Th th thank you, Ducky, and thank you, Nick. Uh, I think I almost just about have enough time to rewrite the entirety of the uh, the conference close. Thank you for all the tips about presenting. I had no idea. Um, that's a lot more people than Mark Pesci. Uh, are you able to run your own timer or should I? Oh, okay, well, um, we're, we're gonna have you on the honor system. And, um, okay, and uh, your time starts um, now. Thank you. Excellent. So yes, um, we ran a hackathon down in, what is it, Waterloo or the heck it was all day long and people came by and did the most amazing things. So I just want to show off a couple of them. The first of them is that you saw the countdown timer yesterday. It was running in JavaScript. Someone recoded it in pure Python who was a basically newbie Python programmer. But I'm going to give it to David who had never programmed in Python before today, right? Yep. And so here, have a Guys, um, this is my first Python program bar one. The first one was a thing that used uh, the Fibonacci sequence to drive this randomly. What you're looking at currently is the CPU activity of each of my CPUs on this machine. Uh, green is CPU one, the blue is CPU two. Um, and hang on a second, I'll see if I can open something stupid like, oh, I don't know, Xcode. Um, <laughs> but, oh, I just happen to have Xcode here. Um, what a thing. Let's open, oh, there you go. So, when the two uh, sides collide, you get red, and that's buried. Right. Thank you, that'll do. Right. Cheers. Excellent. All right, I'm fairly new to Python as well. Um, so, I was just messing around. It took me about an hour to work out how to use um, time functions. So, I made a basic clock. So, I've encoded hours, minutes, and seconds uh, in the first. <laughs> maybe eight of these lights. Um, oh, I decided... Uh, uh, just one moment. Uh, Evan Brumley, could you please take the other podium? I forgot to call you up. Um, except I decided that wasn't a very good use of it, because it's only using about eight of those lights. So I made another one, which I called red versus blue. And how this one works is you've got red and blue kind of game of lifestyle things. They fight each other to the death. Um, we decided in the end that they were communists, because uh, they tended to lose. Um, but then we've decided that was bad and then uh, it went on. But anyway, we thought that was pretty fun. Uh, next person. Hi. Man, that was awesome. Okay, I'm going to mostly let this one talk for itself. Is the audio coming through? Yeah? I'm mute. I'll do anything for you. Got money, just tell me what you want me to. So it's just a level meter. Um, the hardest thing was using Pi Audio to get the audio in from the... Well, originally it was from the microphone, and then I did some Mac OS stuff to redirect the iTunes output. But anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> level meter. Okay. So um, I did uh, some stuff in Python, and then I decided to uh, use a real language like Objective-C. And... Um, what I've made is a really simple iPhone application that uh, lets you paint directly onto the holiday. So I'm going to do a little bit of this, add a bit of that, and that. 
And uh, when I decide that my art is not really art because it's not really free form and creative, I can just do a little flick of my wrist and the whole thing goes away. So um, yeah, basically this is a nice little demonstration for um, giving to people and saying, hey, this is what the whole day can do and uh, I can do all kinds of painting with it. So yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be doing a sprint using IOTIS and more of this tomorrow, so please join us. Uh, before you go, uh, Mark gave us a really good dinner keynote yesterday uh, and I forgot to give him his keynote gifts. Uh, so here is your PyCon Australia 2013 coffee mug and a bag of Norwegian Blue to put in it. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, next up on my left will be Brett Wilkins. On my right, we now have Evan Brumley who is going to be telling us about Python and the PlayStation Move. Time starts now. Good. Is that right? Yep. All right, awesome. Um, all right, so this is something I've been sort of playing with over the last year. Um, I was sort of inspired by, if anyone knows, uh, Johann Sebastian Joust. Um, there's been a lot of sort of people playing around with this, and there's actually a, a really good um, public, uh, public API that you can use to play with it. So I figured I'd just uh, introduce, um, introduce it. Um, so I've also named this the building the world first restful interface to interpretive dance. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, that's, I suppose, possible. Um, all right, so a brief introduce, introduction. So these are the controllers. Um, they have their Bluetooth. Um, they have a standard sort of USB port on the bottom, uh, three-axis accelerometer, three-axis gyroscope. Um, there are three LEDs in the ball, so you can produce any color you want. So they're basically using the same sort of stuff as these. Um, rumble, they have an analog trigger on the back. Um, stacks of buttons, and if you look around, you can buy them for about 25 bucks. So I mean, they're amazingly cheap. Um, you can also run up to seven from one PC on one Bluetooth connection. I don't know if anyone's actually ported the, the PS Move API to um, uh, Raspberry Pi, but if you did that, you could hook up seven of these to one of those and do something really interesting. Um, so the PS Move API, um, it's available at those URLs. Um, it's uh, Pretty interesting uh, thing. I mean, it was originally designed for Johann Sebastian Joust. Um, so the guys who were sort of designing that were the guys who originally wrote the code. Um, and it's also been used, uh, if anyone hasn't seen Johann Sebastian Joust, it involves, um, it's basically a very slow motion Joust. Um, the, you can't, you, the idea is you're not supposed to set off the accelerometer in your device, but you want other people to set off theirs. Um, and then, <laughs> so there's, um, uh, there's music that goes, that plays uh, Johann Sebastian Bach in the background that varies in tempo, and if it's going fast, then you can move fast. If it's going slow, you have to move slow. They've also done one called, done one called Edgar Rice Frotteur, <laughs> which involves 20 PlayStation moves on a network um, hanging from a roof. Um, the idea being that you have a color. At all times, you have to be holding the trigger of a PS move of your color. So it's kind of like a big game of Twister. <laughs> right, so the PS Move is written in C. Um, it has pretty good Python bindings um, via Swig, which is sort of converts the C API to an API whatever else you want. Um, and it'll take you an evening to install. It's kind of interesting. You'll probably learn something about CMake. If anyone else has used CMake, uh, it's probably a good thing not to learn things about, but you will. <laughs> um, so. I was sort of thinking about this last night. I went, I saw Mark's, Mark's talk last night, and I thought, well, these are things. Uh, and it was 11 o'clock last night, and I got, got back to my hotel room, and I was like, well, I might, might as well make something. Um, so if you look at the GitHub repository, you'll see that the initial commit's about 3 a.m. last night. Um, anyway, I've created a thing called PS Move RESTful, um, which is basically a RESTful interface to the PlayStation Move controllers. Uh, it uses Flask, Flask RESTful, and the PS Move API. Um, so I'll just uh, flick across to my code, which has disappeared. There we go. Um, so actually I'll bring up, there's a better idea, browser. So here's these two um, controllers um, in a RESTful interface. Um, so if I press down the trigger, you should see the trigger on one of them turn to true. See BTNT has gone to true, and the accelerometer should be changing. If 
I put it upside down, you'll see AY goes to negative one. If I put it up to top, it goes up to one. Um, and you can query this however you like. So I've got a terminal open here. I've been pushing things with requests. So I've set up a URL with uh, just localhost slash controller slash zero. Um, red. Oops. Slightly less red. <laughs> Let's make it, uh, we'll sort of add some green into the mix. That's so that's yellow because it's red as well. I can make it rumble as well, but I'm going to run out of time. Gee, I could probably, let's try that just quickly. There you go. Okay, so uh, up last on my right will be Tim Ansell, so if you could come and set up. Uh, and on my left, Brett Wilkins, read this. Your time starts now. All right, um, this is going to be really quick. Um, so yeah, having a favorite language is really cool. Um, Python was my favorite language, it was my first uh, dynamic language, for those who haven't seen my talk earlier today. Um, but yeah, limiting yourself to that one language isn't so cool. Um, somewhat out of place, but read this book, uh, Practic Practical or Oriented Design in Ruby, um, an Agile Primer. It basically encompasses a whole lot of Agile stuff and also, of course, Object Oriented Design. It does say Ruby, but you can always rip out the Ruby stuff and just think in Python if you really want to do that. Um, this was actually the original thing I was going to try and talk about, but that would only be one, one slide. Um, so. The rest of what I've got to say is try Ruby if you really want. <laughs> try Golang. Um, I hear a lot of Python people like Golang when they try it. Um, it is quite like Python in some ways, unlike in others, but you'll probably enjoy it. Um, try Rust. Try Clojure. Try something else. Um, sort of make, you know, uh, try something that is not really object oriented, try something functional. Um, try something, try aspect oriented programming if you find something to do that. Try prologue. <laughs> right. Thank you. And our last light, lightning talk is going to be presented by Tim Ansell. Time starts now. Um, this isn't part of my lightning talk, but if you want a lightning timer, there was lightningtimer.net, but that's down. You can use this now. Not everybody has fancy lights. Um, they will. <laughs> I think PyCon was pretty awesome. Who agrees? Yeah. Um, sadly, PyCon is pretty much over, um, unless you want to come to the sprints. Um, and now I'm going to be lazy and have somebody talk for me. Sound a bit higher, please. been to a PyCon Sprint before, um, you should definitely try it and uh, make sure you stay for the next one. The Sprints are great because they don't just let you put a face to a name, they let you put a person to ideas that you're working with. Uh, sprinting is an excellent way to get everyone, get everyone together, especially new contributors. We have, I think, a half dozen or more people who have already you know, submitted patches, gotten tickets closed out. This has been tremendous for us. and you know, beginners keep you honest about how good your documentation is, about how good your new contributor guidelines are. So we've been really excited to see all of these new people here at PyCon. I'm going to rush out there because there's a lot of code to do. See you later. Sprints are awesome! So that was captured at PyCon US, but I think the sprints here are just going to be even awesomer. Um, so you should definitely be staying. If you're not, I recommend changing your flights. Um, <laughs> Um, so, PyCon um, AU is a Linux Australia event. If you haven't heard Chris repeat it multiple times, um, Linux Australia does other things. Um, it's kind of got an irrelevant name. It's more an open source Australia thing, but because of history, it ended up named Linux Australia. Um, 
So it runs other conferences. Linux.conf.au is their really big one, which is where it kind of got its name from. Again, this is more an open source conference rather than a Linux only conference. Um, there's a huge number of Python developers there. Um, OpenStack was really big last year, so if you went to OpenStack MiniConf, I think they had an OpenStack MiniConf for LCA as well, so they seem to be everywhere now. Um, they also have a whole bunch of PHP stuff if you're sadly doing that, um, like Drupal Down Under, WordCamps, um, Joomla Day, I think it was, I can't remember what the name was. Um, LCA, uh, Linux.conf really wants to support more conferences, um, so why not try running your own? Um, you should become a member, it takes like 30 seconds, you go to um, linux.org.au and click the sign up link and then you'll get uh, like a thing and they'll say yes. Um, it doesn't cost anything, it's free. Um, so there's also other things that aren't Linux Australia like bar camps, although we, uh, Linux Australia has contributed to various bar camps. Um, there's also OSDC, which is apparently in New Zealand this year. Um, you should join a user group. I thought there was going to be another talk on user groups, but um, definitely join a user group, Django user group, Python user group, Linux user group. Um, I'd also like to point out that there's pyvideo.org, which has recordings from PyCon AU 2012 and a whole bunch of other PyCons. Um, so I think that's my last slide. Um, so I'd just like to repeat, PyCon was awesome. Thanks for all coming and hand over to Chris.